What would you do in the zombie apocalypse? It's a hypothetical discussion that I'm almost certain that you will have had before, even just with yourself. Some people like my brother Elliot might take the scientific route, talking about the best supplies to ensure food and first aid is available in the long run. Others think about their role in a group, what they might have to offer, how they would find people to trust. And others still might decide that they don't wanna survive at all. The zombie genre has the potential to give us everything from an ethical thought experiment to a meaningful look at our ideas of individualism and community, or even just just a fun icebreaker exercise at a corporate event, if, you know, you're brave enough. Today I want to look at the current presence and future potential of queerness within these stories, because however much the naysayers might have rallied against the inclusion in The Last of Us, queerness and the zombie genre go hand in hand in so many ways. The history of zombies. The earliest use of the word itself is within Haitian and voodoo folklore, where they're said to be corpses revived by the use of magic. But the basic concept of people returning from the dead as dangerous creatures has a widespread history of fear around the world. Archaeological sites of ancient Greece, for example, found skeletons pinned down by rocks and other heavy objects to prevent their resurrection. In one way or another, this is a creature that humans have feared for thousands of years. Over the centuries, the idea of the zombie has expanded to include not just the undead, but also other origin stories, the most common being those bitten by another zombie, infected with a virus, through a scientific accident, or exposure to radiation. The 1930s saw the first films about zombies, creating the image of the soulless and emotionless monster, often with the socio-political elements from the folklore remaining. The 1932 film White Zombie, for example, involved a land-owning entrepreneur bringing back the dead to work on his sugarcane plantation. It doesn't take a huge leap to see the thematic readings there. In 1968, George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead was released, itself including commentary on capitalism and modern consumerism. As Professor Peter Dendel has explained, this significant cinematic moment liberated the zombie from the shackles of a master and invested them not with a function, a job or task such as zombies were standardly given by voodoo priests, but rather a drive, eating flesh. This landmark movie has been credited with beginning the popularization of the genre in mainstream cinema, and it certainly is popular. In 2014, at least 55 zombie-related movies were released in a single year alone. I think nowadays when we think of the zombie genre, a few common elements arise. The stories are often focused on the personal, following a small group of survivors. Although it has the scope of a disaster movie with the potential for worldwide destruction, a key part of the zombie threat, it differs from the pillars of that genre. In a zombie movie, the protagonists aren't necessarily necessarily those with the power to reverse the disaster. We almost certainly aren't following the head scientist, the president, or the soldier who bravely destroys the comet or flies their jet into the alien spaceship, for example. There are also common thematic elements too. Many zombie movies tap into the idea that humans are the real monsters, doubling the fear and terror of the genre. The surviving members of humanity often prove themselves as equally inhuman as their zombie counterparts, willing to use others to protect themselves or even make the apocalypse more sadistically bearable. A classic example that comes to mind is the I Promise Them Women scene from 28 Days Later. According to Stanford literary scholar Dr. Angela Bacara Vitigar, the modern fascination with end of the world narratives can be traced back to the advent of nuclear warfare during World War II. The horrendous violence on a mass scale that was witnessed gave many ordinary people a greater understanding of the human capacity for inhumanity. She theorized, We're left with this cultural fixation on fictionalizing our own death, very specifically mass scale destruction. It's not only the survival of ourselves as individuals that we are concerned with, but the survival of entire communities, even humanity as a whole. In this way, zombie stories do more than give us an individual stake in a movie with the danger limited to the characters we follow on screen. It's also about the destruction we know is happening around them and the lack of safe harbor for them to return to. Max Brooks, author of World War Z has argued, a zombie story gives people a fictional lens to see the real problems of the world, societal breakdown, famine, disease, chaos in the streets. And I think it's key to the genre's appeal, right? The question of what we become when the structures and limits of society are removed, both as zombies and as survivors. It's interesting to note that zombies hit all five of the elements of Carl Albrecht's five basic fears. Extinction or death. This is an obvious one. The human race itself is at risk of extinction within pretty much every iteration of the zombie genre. Mutilation. The decaying corpse visuals of zombies, even those that don't start out as risen dead, is universally recognizable. Loss of autonomy. This is a particularly key element of the zombie genre in comparison to even other infected human creature narratives. 
As a zombie, you are utterly out of control, in contrast to werewolves who might only lose control one night a month, or vampires who retain their human autonomy. One of the most chilling elements of The Last of Us, many have pointed out, is that those infected seem to retain consciousness of what the fungus is forcing their body to do and their brain to want. Social separation or becoming a non-person. Again, this is pretty self-explanatory in terms of the zombie infection, but also taps into the ideas of being separated from other survivors and human contact. And finally, ego death or the loss of integrity of the self. I mean, need I say more? Many of these elements of fear can also be mapped onto the very real experiences and perceptions of queerness in the world today, the ways the lenses of homophobia and transphobia view the LGBTQ plus community as non-people, seeing a fundamental part of us as false and unnatural, for example, how the experience of being closeted is often linked to the loss of integrity of self, the very real loss of autonomy in societies that will force you into heteronormative lives or prevent you from transitioning, the fears of children being mutilated from transphobic pundits. All of these map so easily onto these kind of fears. What better way to enforce ideas of otherness than by making queer people and queerness itself seem monstrous? The queer villain trope has a long history in cinema, I've talked about it in many videos on my channel already, but essentially it forces LGBTQ plus characters into the role of wrongdoer and ties stereotypical queer mannerisms, behaviours and acts of self-expression to villainous roles. The monstrous is created and then forced upon queerness by those outside of the community, stoking fear that aligns with anti-queer politics, lawmaking and social attitudes to fan those flames into mainstream society. There is fear from without and from within, fear of isolation and rejection by queer people and fear of infection and corruption against them. These fears around zombies and queerness mirror each other in ways that have been utilised by indie filmmakers over the years, but more as a disparate collection of projects than a clear subgenre or trope. Movie titles like At Twilight Come the Flesh Eaters, Creatures from the Pink Lagoon, The Nature of Nicholas and Gay Zombie are seen scattered as references in academic papers, but are often out of print and unavailable to watch themselves. Ironically, the most readily available queer zombie media online is arguably a 2000 spoof sketch on YouTube that misses the interesting potentiality of the genre and instead treats queerness itself as a world-ending disease. But in recent years, we've seen two standout examples of zombie TV shows which integrate queerness within not just its overarching plot and characters, but its thematic resonance as well. Let's start with The Last of Us. Based on the video game of the same name, The Last of Us centres around a post-apocalyptic world 20 years after humanity began to be infected by a fungus that turns them into zombies. We follow hardened smuggler Joel, who has been tasked with a mission to accompany teenager Ellie to a group of freedom fighters known as the Fireflies, outside the relative safety of an uninfected human compound. In season one, we're introduced to four queer characters, Ellie herself, her best friend Riley, and two men we meet only in a flashback episode called Bill and Frank. And although it might seem counterintuitive, intuitive in the world of The Last of Us, in many ways, these characters are able to thrive in a way they might not have in a traditional setting, from isolation to community. In episode three, we're introduced to Bill, a doomsday prepper and self-described survivalist who has been meticulously planning for the end of days. The episode follows him from outbreak day all the way to Ellie and Joel passing through his compound 20 years later. All his paranoid work comes to fruition when the town he lives in is put under mandatory evacuation as the outbreak begins. Bill hides in his basement as the town is emptied and soon emerges from his house to a completely empty neighbourhood. He's alone, but the bright sunshine, stillness and almost idyllic front lawns don't let us dwell on the reality of that to begin with. We watch as he builds fences and puts extensive security measures in place to keep the zombies and everyone else out. Bill is seemingly now living his best survivalist life. Although we're never told what specifically led to him being a prepper, we do see a blatant hostility towards governmental authority and eventually when he meets Frank, a vulnerability as he begins to express his suppressed queerness. It isn't hard to draw parallels between Bill isolating himself out of what he sees as a necessity to survive and the experiences of queer people physically and metaphorically separated from a society that might mean them harm. Bill knows the world can be a cruel and dangerous place before the actual zombies arrive on the scene. With that knowledge of the potential dangers becomes an obsession that stops him from actually connecting and forming community in the pre and post outbreak world at least at first. 
The episode setup begs the question, now that he's living without traditional societal norms, is there the possibility that he will be able to live the way that he wants to? Or will the confirmation of humanity's apparent inherent violence and corrupt nature only make Bill isolate himself further? Everything changes when he meets Frank. Frank is the last survivor in a group that had been looking for somewhere safe, who ends up caught in one of Bill's traps. Bill reluctantly helps him out of the trap, shares a meal with him, and that night agrees to take him in. Soon the two share a blossoming romance that we see on fold across the rest of the episode. This romance gives us intimate and vulnerable connection between the two men, from first kisses, to screaming fights, to tending to each other's wounds. Often queer characters' narrative arcs will primarily be about the need to suppress or hide their identity out to fear of being discovered, and there could easily have been a version of The Last of Us that doubled down on that. The show doesn't pull punches with its portrayal of fear and destruction after all, but the episode gives us the opposite of the fear of your secrets being known, instead allowing Bill and Frank the joy of being truly seen by one another. This contrast of gentle soft queer love against the violence of the apocalypse background of the show feels special. It is in many ways a radical thing to give the queer characters that role in the narrative. Creator and showrunner of The Last of Us, Craig Mazin, on The Last of Us podcast said in response to this episode that, this is something that I talked a lot about with our many partners on the episode who were gay. So what is it like when you're trying to figure out if the other person is like you in the minority of sexuality? And all of the men that I spoke with basically said, there are people you really don't know about. There are people you're pretty sure about. And then there are people you're like, oh, I see you. And this was a case where we felt it was important that Frank could see Bill. As Bill and Frank get to know each other, we see Bill's body language change. The walls he's put up around himself externally in the persona he presents start to fade. The person he is away from the homophobic background noise of his pre-outbreak life emerges. This connection and intimacy sees Bill shift from the survival of the self to the protection of others. It gives him an opening into community and all the joy and pain that comes with it. Like he says of Frank, I was never afraid before you showed up. Because opening yourself up to the possibility of love is also giving yourself up to the inevitability of pain, of loss, in many ways. But this stubborn, grumpy, isolationist man decides that it's worth it. We find out at the end of the episode that Bill wrote a letter to Joel before he died, explaining what had happened, knowing that Joel would likely be the next person to come by the house. In it, he said, I used to hate the world and was happy when everyone died, but I was wrong, because there was one person worth saving. That's what I did. I saved him. That's why men like you and me are here. We have a job to do. And speaking of queer romance, now seems like a great time to thank today's returning sponsor, Dipsy. Once more, I, committed asexual Rowan Ellis, am giving the people what they want. And that is hundreds of short and sexy audio stories, sleep and wellness sessions, and sex and relationship education by and for women, featuring characters of all genders and sexualities. I listen to one of their soothing nature soundscapes. You listen to a fake dating friends to lovers story. I listen to a rainy cafe as I do some reading. You listen to an erotic fantasy about a charismatic butch coming to fix your sink. Last time we talked about the Dipsy Cinematic Universe and Jay the charming non-binary barista. I have more news on that front. Uh, the butch handy woman is called Rachel and her romance with Lucy is this whole series. They hook up in a lesbian bar, she rescues Lucy when her car breaks down, and there are even audio options to hear Rachel talk directly to you. Dipsy has stories for listeners of all sexualities and over half of their voice talent are people of colour, plus new content is released every week so you can always find something new to explore. Check out Dipsy for a go-to place for spicing up your alone time, exploring your fantasies with a partner, or just chilling out as you go to sleep. Maybe to this track where you can fall asleep to a cute girl playing the guitar for you by the fireside as a summer storm rolls by. For my viewers, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Rowan Ellis. That's 30 days of free full access when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash Rowan Ellis. Okay, back to the zombies. Bury your gaze? Ellie might be immune to the infection, but none of these queer characters are immune to death. Inevitably, when any queer character meets their end on screen, people will bandy around the bury your gaze trope accusation. But for me, in this show with these characters, this trope is kind of strangely subverted in many ways. By the end of episode three, we've seen Bill and Frank live together for going on 20 years. But as the show itself acknowledges, growing old happily and loved as a queer person feels like a privilege. I think especially for queer men who would have lived through the AIDS crisis like Bill and Frank would have. And they suggest as much in the show. I'm sorry. For what? Getting older faster than you. I like you older. Older means we're still here. 
Bill and Frank don't meet a violent death at the hands of homophobic attackers, or the classic bury your gaze weapon of choice, a stray bullet. Instead, Frank decides where and how he wants to die. He's suffering from an illness that isn't treatable, and knowing he only has so much time left, he details to Bill how he would like to spend his remaining time, giving himself as much agency as possible in a world where most people are taken down screaming, and lose all agency in their undeath as the fungus takes over their body, forcing it to kill, while they watch on. As Bill says, when revealing to Frank that he has given a lethal dose of sleeping pills to them both, so that they can die peacefully together. This isn't the tragic suicide at the end of the play. I'm old, I'm satisfied, and you were my purpose. They had the opportunity to live a fully realised life together, just like any traditional heterosexual happily ever after, something so often denied to queer characters on screen. As critic David Opie explains, Younger queer people need to see a future for themselves that isn't full of pain or fear, because if you can't see it existing out in the world, it's hard to imagine it for yourself. And then there's the countless queer people from older generations who are robbed of their chance to find this kind of happiness, to love each other for a long, long time. They deserve to see a story like this too, their story out in the world at last. We often see the burial gaze trope in the context of queer characters dying to further straight and cis characters' arcs, with the queer characters being the first or only ones to die, or receiving particularly gruesome or tragic deaths, with little actual character arc of their own. But within the context of the show, we've seen that death and grief touch everyone. The character of Riley, unlike Bill and Frank, doesn't get to experience a long and full life. In episode 7, we see in a flashback sequence that Ellie and Riley were both attacked and bitten by an infected person, having snuck out together one night. When they realise their shared fate, Riley says to Ellie, We don't quit. Whether it's two minutes or two days, we don't give up. I don't want to give that up. There's this tragic parallel with Bill and Frank's decision, giving these characters as much agency as the story allows, as well as Riley finding joy and meaning in her own terms through her new fan queer love till the very end. We have the traditional zombie bite death with Riley, the peaceful death of two husbands in love with Bill and Frank, and then the centering of Ellie and her enduring immunity, avoiding the single gay character's fake cliché. A place for us. These couples don't just have a sense of agency within a world of chaos, they're also given dignity in their time on screen, particularly in their final moments. After Bill and Frank make the decision to end their lives, they're given a sense of peace. We see them enter their bedroom and the door closes and that's it. We as a viewer don't see their dying moments or their bodies when Ellie and Joel realise that something's wrong. We don't even see Ellie and Joel seeing their bodies. They're simply allowed to rest in peace. They're given privacy, an intimacy that the viewer's not allowed to see. The ending shot of the episode instead lingers out of the open bedroom window, harkening back to the original game and giving us a moment of calm and stillness. When speaking about the motif in the game, and this episode in particular, showwriter Mason has said, As a player, I just always loved the start screen in The Last of Us. Looking at this window and how peaceful it was, even though the world is not peaceful, and what happens to these characters isn't peaceful. And it seemed like a good place for us to go. There's an opportunity to show both the idea of this permanent love that's always going to be there in that building, in their home, but also just the theme of that window being the epitome of peace in the world of The Last of Us. Bill and Frank have been able to claim this space for themselves. There is love, safety, understanding and vulnerability in that house. A life that, ironically, it suggested Bill would never have had if the end of the world hadn't come. The attention that Frank spends on the house is an expression of his love. After an argument where Frank asks for some pain, which Bill is reluctant to give, he says, This isn't for me, this is for us. Who cares what they look like? I do. Our home isn't just our house, it's everything around us. Paying attention to things, it's how we show love. This is my street too, just let me love it the way I want to. And in fact, we see at the end of their lives together, the house is full of paintings, shows of love all over their small world. As we watch the course of their relationship, it's easy to forget what's happening beyond the fences, with the idyllic setting, neat flower boxes, homegrown strawberries, and white picket fences. Aside from an attack from a group of raiders who approach the gate, their time together in any other context would be considered a pretty standard love story showing a couple throughout everyday life. We see them playing music together, looking after their home, having a dinner party with friends, in a way. 
During Bill and Frank's last day, we even see them get married. This is perhaps the most poignant element of this precious personal queer sanctuary they built together, as the outbreak happened well before equal marriage was enshrined into law in the US. This final act of love was something that they would legally not have been able to do, but it's something that they've decided to do for themselves all the same. Now, in this space, together, there are no restraints. They're granted the joy that they know would have been denied to them otherwise. After all, they've been there for each other in sickness and in health for two decades already. For Ellie and Riley, the mall that they sneak into is another kind of beautifully queer space, a place they get to be themselves. It's full with wonders, as Riley calls them, and we're given a sweet teenage romance between two girls who don't seem to have been brought up in a world of active homophobia. When they kiss, Ellie isn't dramatically fighting her sinful gay feelings. She does say, I'm sorry, but within the show, it seems to be more about the suddenness of the kiss or the possibility of ruining their friendship and not the kiss itself. And then Riley responds with, for what? And then they giggle together. That's it. Not a big deal except for how finally getting to kiss a friend you have a crush on is a big deal in the life of a teenager. Their semi-date in the mall is full of classic imagery of traditional dates that straight teens are able to partake in without worries, photo booths and fairground rides. It was a really emotional thing to see these same cliche moments played out with two girls with sweetness and silliness and so many smiling happy looks at each other. It's something we don't often get to see on screen. These stories dropped into the often grim and dark world of The Last of Us emphasize the idea that after something awful, even world ending happens, you can still find happiness and love. And that in fact, that might be the most important thing that you can do. So The Last of Us shows the potential of including queer survivors in the zombie genre, but what about including queer characters within the class of the undead? Ostensibly, this might strike many as a doubly tricky proposition, combining both the burial gaze and the queers and monsters tropes. But if we dig a bit deeper, we can see how apt this horror subgenre is to explore the experiences and complexities of queerness. After all, if the zombie genre is tied to the personal, wouldn't this concept only be intensified if the idea of the personal reaches the point where we're identifying with the zombies themselves. Horror and homosexuality. First, it's worth noting that just because a trope exists doesn't make it automatically bad representation. The prevalence of queer coding in villains, from monster horror to Disney classics, has long been a topic of discussion. If you're looking for a symbolic monster, then queer people are already aligned with the fear they represent through history and society. As Alessandro Grillo describes in the essay Queering the Dead, Gay Zombies in the Dark Room, queer people are seen to disturb seemingly stable notions of the self by contagion be it of AIDS or of homosexuality itself, or by establishing the possibility of difference, and of community, by acting as a direct menace to receive social structures like the nuclear family. We see themes of contagion, transformation, radicalization across horror, monsters that turn people into creatures like them, who seduce innocence, who destroy families and normality. If you truly believe that queer people are doing these things, then you might produce a horror narrative that paints them as the real villain of the piece. But there's also the opportunity to interrogate the supposed horror of these actions, where the monster is treated with empathy by writers. Does the monster seduce an innocent or simply allow them the escape from heteronormative life that they were already craving? When we look at zombies in particular, there's an obvious string of commentary to be pulled. These are us, they are human, but they are us altered, not quite right. They're unnatural in their undead form or their uncontrolled state. It's uncanny in many ways. And we've seen this used before in classics of the genre to highlight the ways that otherness is employed against actual marginalized communities. As Grilly explains, in the close of Night of the Living Dead, the only human survivor in the house besieged by zombies is paradoxically killed by the police who come to his rescue. Seeing him, an African-American from their helicopter, they mistake him for one of the monsters. There are only a limited number of movies and TV shows that make use of the queer zombie, but the most fleshed out, pardon the pun, happens to be one of my favorite TV shows of all time. So I guess it's time to talk about In the Flesh. In the Flesh is a very different kind of zombie show, choosing to pick up after a treatment for the undead has been found rather than focus on the apocalypse itself. The zombies of In the Flesh are indeed the undead. This isn't a story about people overcome by a virus or a fungus or creatures able to spread their inhuman state through a bite wound. Instead, it takes place in a fictional version of 2010 and the bodies are those who died the year before in 2009, 
reanimated from the grave in an event called The Rising, who then started attacking the living in a mindless rage. We pick up after several years of a human zombie civil war in the UK known as the Pale Wars. Scientists have found a treatment for what is dubbed partially deceased syndrome or PDS. They've rounded up as many PDS sufferers as they can and processed them in massive regional treatment centers with the doctors, pharmacists, and therapists present. They were not in control of themselves in their untreated state and can remember what they did when untreated. So, you know, a lot of them aren't doing very well. The first episode begins as our lead character, a queer teenager called Kieran Walker, is due to be released back into the care of his family. The show follows this premise to all of its logical and often heartbreaking conclusions. What is it like to have lost loved one only for them to return from the dead? Could you kill a monster wearing your family's face? How will humanity react when the zombies who have decimated the population return back into the community? How do you deal with the memories of what you did when you rose from the grave and the people that you killed? In the Flesh takes a very British attitude to the genre, a pacing nine episodes over two seasons and with a limited budget. This isn't a show where you're going to see hordes of CGI zombies swarming towards plucky survivors. Instead, it's an intense and insular drama about a single fictional village in West Yorkshire called Rawton. Because when the dead began to rise, the government concentrated resources into the major cities. And so many rural and isolated communities formed their own militia known as the Human Volunteer volunteer force or HVF. As such, many people in the village, including Kieran's teenage sister Jem, actively fought and killed PDS sufferers. The first season is about the initial wave of PDS sufferers attempting to reintegrate back into life in Rawton. We see the prejudice of the townsfolk, the tensions across human and not quite human inhabitants, the effects of the trauma this period has had on them all, and always in the background, and sometimes the foreground of the show, is the threat of violence on both sides. The second season sees Kieran ready to leave Rawton for France to start a new life, but before he can leave, an undead travel ban is put in place as the government rolls out a scheme to ensure that PDS sufferers give back to the communities they once unwillingly terrorised. It becomes apparent across this season that this is a penance the government has no plans on ending anytime soon, with PDS sufferers losing their citizenship indefinitely. Alongside this, we also have external forces arriving in the village, as it was allegedly the first site of the rising, and political and religious groups are determined to use that significance for their own gains. The show examines queerness and othering through the classic metaphoric lens of the zombie, but also gives us explicit queerness within the characters on screen in Kieran, Rick and Simon across the two seasons. Kieran, as I mentioned, is the lead character of the show. Only 18 years old when he dies, he never fit into the macho masculinity of many men within his homophobic village, instead turning to art to express himself through struggles with his mental health and striking up a close friendship with a classmate Rick. Rick is one of Kieran's childhood friends, with their friendship developing into a romantic relationship born of their closeness when they were living teens. For the events of the series, he was pushed to join the army by his father after he discovered Rick and Kieran's relationship and was killed while on duty overseas in 2009. We find out towards the end of season one that the loss of Rick was a trigger for Kieran's original death as he took his own life in the woods where they would meet to be together. Rick's father, Bill Macy, whose actions inadvertently led to the deaths of both boys, went on to become the head of the local human volunteer force during the Pale Wars, when Rick, who also wrote during the rising, returns from his treatment, his father is in total denial of his PDS status as well as his sexuality. In season two, we're also introduced to Simon, a charismatic follower of the undead prophet, a PDS activist figure who claims to be seeking a second rising to wipe out humanity entirely. Although he's initially in Rawton to hunt down and kill the first risen, his growing care for Kieran turns into a romantic relationship that causes him to defy his mission after he discovers that Kieran himself was the first to rise from the grave in Rawton. I want to talk a bit about the themes and topics that the show discusses, always with both the metaphorical and canonical queerness in mind. Firstly, the obvious, sexuality and discrimination. Sexuality and PDS are explicitly linked on screen in the show in terms of how the reactions to both mirror each other so clearly within the village. Bill Macy is clearly in denial about both his son's PDS status and his sexuality, for example. He conceptualizes humans and PDS sufferers as separate from each other, just as he does with gay and straight people, not only different, but lesser. That lesser status allows him to treat them with violence and contempt, using animalistic language to try and persuade Rick himself to kill Kieran. When you finished him, say something like, when I'm out up with the walker lad, he started foaming at the mouth. Something like that. He's not a person, Rick. He's an animal. Worse than an animal. They might walk and talk, but rotters are evil. Here we can see this cognitive dissonance at work. Rotters are evil, he tells his PDS sufferer son. 
But this isn't something he can force his son simply not to be, like he believes he's done by sending Rick to the army to straighten him out. Rick is unquestionably one of the risen. Similarly, in reality, he is just as able to change his sexuality as he is to magically become someone who never rose. When Rick attempts to stop his father killing Kieran, coming to him for the first time without the makeup and contact lenses he's been given to disguise the visual appearance of his PDS status, we see a coming out scene. Rick tells his father, I don't want to hurt Ren. He's my best mate. If Ren's evil dad, then so am I. It's this desperate hope that if his father truly sees him as he is, if he loves him like he's supposed to, he'll see Kieran in this light too. Instead, the opposite happens, and Bill sees his son as a queer PDS sufferer and takes his son's life off screen for it. He then snaps back to denial, telling his wife that the last time he saw their son was showing him off to the airport when he joined the army, reinventing the reality of his son's identities and erasing both his queerness and his PDS status in one fell swoop. Series creator Dominic Mitchell has said before in interviews, I always thought thought that at its core, it's about otherness and the fear of otherness. And I think it's fair to say that the othering of PDS sufferers across the series is achingly familiar with parallels to queerphobic discrimination felt in the layers of the narrative, from individual characters' attitudes to sweeping political movements in the second season. But there's also this underlying essence of internalised homophobia in the way Kira meticulously covers up his outward appearance, whether it's its appearance with makeup and contacts or his behaviour. One scene in particular sees him sitting at the table with his family, play acting at eating the dinner in front of him to make his presence more palatable to his parents. PDS sufferers don't eat, but to acknowledge that would be a step too far for his parents and so he mimes cutting and eating the food, going through the motions of what a normal son would do and say for their sake. It's something that reflects the unspoken ways that he censored himself in life while struggling with his sexuality and the loss of Rick. In the show, after Bill kills Rick, Kieran isolates himself in the cave where they used to meet and his mum comes to find him. The tearful exchange feels just as much about Kieran's fear of rejection for his sexuality as it is about his PDS status. He says, It's becoming just like it was before and I don't know how to change it. This time you live. You don't leave. You stay. You want me to stay when I'm like this? Yes, God, Kieran, I'd love you with all my heart if you came back as a... as a goldfish. The way the family have been tiptoeing around each other gives a sense of tolerance rather than acceptance for Kieran. And at the end of season one, he takes a risk to break down those barriers of benign politeness. He confronts his placid father, pleading to be engaged with, told off for running off the day before and worrying them. And we see the parental fear finally bubble to the surface. The idea that they aren't getting him to mime eating at the table to punish him or because they want him to be different, but because they're scared for him and what this means for his future. Just the same as parents of queer children worry about the hardships that they might face. It's one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the show. I was concerned. Yeah, I know that now. Very concerned. Why? Because. 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 Because you know why. Tell me. You know. Come on, dad. Come on, harder. Because I was worried sick. And we realise that his dad isn't talking about Kieran running off that day. He's talking about Kieran disappearing in 2009 after hearing of Rick's death in the army and how he went out to find Kieran and got up to the cave. And we realise just before he says it with a horrifying certainty that he was the one that found Kieran's body. There you are. You're sitting down, leaning on a rock. And I think, oh, thank God, he's okay. He's okay. But then I get close and you're covered in blood. So much blood. And I take you in my arms and I run with you in my arms and I run and I run and I run, but I can't because you're, you're... And in that moment, Kieran stares at his father's arms out in front of him as if carrying the invisible body of his younger self. And he walks forward to pull his father into an embrace. Throughout the show, there's this continuous atmosphere of public and private suppression, especially in season one, which reflects the stigma surrounding both queer and PDS identities. When we finally see Kieran and Rick meet for the first time since The Rising, what should be a Romeo and Juliet reunited moment between these two boys is instead stilted by taking place in the local pub surrounded by the people in the village. The attitudes are a blanket of fear as Rick greets Kieran with a, you right, mate? reinforcing an acceptable level of unemotional male friendship for those who might overhear, offering only a handshake, not even a hug, let alone a kiss. 
We see it in their longing expressions, the weight of this suppression, but it isn't enough to take the risk. They've survived the apocalypse and found their way back to each other, but they're too scared to show how much that means to them. Although not explicitly discussed in In the Flesh, I think it's worth noting the potential parallels of zombie narratives with AIDS myths and metaphors. When placing queer characters as the treated zombies themselves, we can see them as victims of a so-called plague that changes how they're perceived by wider society. As Tommy Dickinson noted in the book Curing Queers, Mental Nurses and their patients. HIV was originally dubbed GRID, gay-related immune deficiency, a label that is partially responsible for the framing of AIDS as a gay plague. The rhetoric of contagion, infection, disease, and fear permeate both the fictional and real worlds here. The fear not just of the HIV virus itself, but the human beings who live with it has led to a stigma that still exists today. Conspiracies of widespread plots to deliberately infect unsuspecting innocents with HIV reflect the pre-existing conspiracies of queer people infecting others with queerness itself. I think this metaphor walks a thin line between the potential to give us an empathetic look at this experience, but also risking linking HIV to too closely with the horrific implications and dangers of the zombie figure. In season two of In the Flesh, we do see a connection specifically made with PDS human sex, but at heterosexual brothel, with MP Maxine Martin proclaiming, is this what they meant when they told us to integrate? Thank God we're waking up is all I can say, because this is only the start. If this illness goes untreated, we are vulnerable. Her own prejudice is couched in the language of concern for public safety, a common rhetorical device used against sex workers as well as the LGBT community in real life. Her comments also demonstrate the impossible hypocrisy of her party's policies, the demand that there isn't integrate into society, but also stay outside of it. Assimilation versus liberation. The tension between assimilation into mainstream society or liberation from its constraints are central themes of In the Flesh for both PDS sufferers and queer characters. The questions of, do you try to integrate and become palatable to their sensibilities? Do you work to contain and alter yourself to fit the mold? Is that the easy road or the hard one? Is that the right way or the wrong? The ability to pass as a heterosexual or cisgender person, to fit so well into the ideas of appearance and behaviour that people assume that you're straight and cis, runs parallel to the ideas of assimilation. But the two are not always linked. The way that someone speaks or how they look is not necessarily within their control. It's not necessarily an act of decision made to deliberately assimilate. Passing is a concept within the LGBTQ plus community that exists on a complex spectrum. For some, passing as straight is a way to avoid danger, whereas for others it feels like a form of erasure on the part of a heteronormative society. Passing as cis might give a feeling of safety, gender euphoria or validation, or the complete opposite from those within the trans and non-binary communities. Passing might be something that you only do some of the time, or only in certain spaces, or with certain people. We see some of this same discourse focused around PDS sufferers passing for living and in the flesh. As part of their medication packs, they're given coloured contact lenses that disguise the characteristic fractured pupils of PDS, as well as foundation moves to cover up their bloodless skin. In short, they're being told to pass as alive. We get shots of Kieran and Rick putting on the moose and contacts in front of the mirror at various points in the first series. They're ritualising this masking of their inner selves in a way, and it's hard not to see the parallels to both their repressed sexualities. It's a performance for others, but also for themselves for much of the show. They need the security of the mask just as much as the living villagers need it to feel safe. Yet we also see the limits of attempting to pass. In season two, there's this scene where two of the Risen, Amy and Simon, come into the local pub where Kieran is working without their moose or contacts on. Members of the old human volunteer force began yelling abuse at them, clearly against those so-called rotters who don't conform. Yet when Kieran, who's wearing the moose and contacts, tells the screaming HVF patrons to leave, they respond, I don't take orders from a lad wearing makeup. Prejudice against PDS sufferers and against queer people are both evident in this attitude. Either way, Kieran cannot win, whether he tries to pass or not, because assimilation ultimately is a thankless task. It's about other people's comfort over your own needs. It doesn't matter how much moose you wear, you're still fundamentally seen as inferior, even if you disguise yourself as normal. At the end of the first episode, Kieran sees his neighbour shot in the street in her nightgown by Rick's father Bill. Before Bill kills her, he asks, why do your eyes look like mine? When she tells him that she's wearing contacts, he responds in this terrifyingly gentle tone, take them out, love. When she does, he shoots her. 
It doesn't matter to him that she was trying to fit in, to assimilate back into life. There was nothing she could do to change the fundamental hatred and fear that he had for her difference. There's this scene in season two where Kieran brings Simon to dinner at his parents' house. The meal is interrupted by the arrival of Jem and fellow HVF member Gary, who begins to describe his pleasure while hunting down PDS sufferers during the Pale Wars. As one critic, Stacey Gillis, observes, Although the subject matter of the conflict between the two couples seems to focus on the issue of PDS and living animosity, it is impossible to ignore the fact that Kieran's narration of his fear whilst being alive and the exhilaration felt after returning from the dead is first ignored by his family, then repressed more through repeated entreaties to stop talking. Even more impossible to ignore is the polite efforts made by Kieran and Simon whilst the social group to which they belong is bashed by a member of a much more privileged group. Along with the fact that one homosexual couple sits surrounded by one heterosexual couple, which attacks our identity while the other chooses to ignore and dismiss it, the whole scene reads as a metaphor for the hopelessness of the assimilation of queer identity. Ultimately, Kieran's journey through season two is one of personal liberation. At first, he's instinctively against foregoing the cosmetic elements of his treatment pack, but throughout the course of the series, he starts to question where the attitude comes from. This is an interesting deviation from a lot of traditional coming of age narratives, which move from wild youth to confident social adulthood, encouraging the idea that fitting into society is a successful growing up story, that you're on your journey to work and marriage and children. In season one, we see Kieran not even being able to look at himself in the mirror. He refuses to see himself in his unmade up state as it reminds him too much of his difference and his expressions of self are mired in shame. Whereas in season two, and especially with his relationship with Simon, we start to understand and that actually his journey to find his strength is going to be a, the complete opposite of this assimilation into human society. It's going to be about acknowledging his own differences while still being able to live beside the people that he loves who don't identify the same way as him. Kieran's rejection of PDS assimilation is hand in hand with the rejection of heteronormative assimilation through the encouragement of his love interest, Simon, who's a confidently non-conformist activist. Simon, however, is caught up in a kind of liberation extremism in his place with the undead prophet, a PDS leader who preaches PDS superiority. Simon's experiences being experimented on against his will in the development process for the PDS treatment left him with a lot of anger and resentment towards humanity, and assimilation back into that felt impossible for him. So when the only alternative presented to him is in the form of the Undead Liberation Army, he's all too easy to radicalise. Simon's attitude to the treatment of PDS sufferers throughout the show seems to be a mix of his genuine feelings and the doctrines of the Undead Prophet, as he makes speeches to the local PDS in Rawton. I went down to the GP surgery today. They had two rabbits there, locked up in a cage, that they're going to send away for treatment so they can teach them to integrate, to be what the living demand. I find myself looking at them, wondering how long they were going to be in that cage. Huh. How long are you going to be in your cage? What's stopping you from being the people you are, instead of copies of who you used to be, of what they tell you you have to be? Why don't you break free? Why don't you show yourselves? Because when you do, when you finally do, I promise you're not going to want to go back. Because you're going to be beautiful. You're going to be flawless. You're going to be the future. At first, this group is portrayed in the show as the only current alternative to the extreme of docile assimilation. But it's Kieran who eventually finds his own middle ground that's authentic to him, that doesn't rely on rejecting any part of himself or those he loves. That being someone with PDS doesn't necessarily mean hating all of living humanity, and that once being human doesn't make his life with PDS a source of damnation either. Mental health and trauma. The show does an incredible job of emphasizing the long-term consequences of mental illness and external trauma, rather than ignoring or resolving them after one episode or two. And it feels particularly tragic yet realistic to have our queer lead Kieran suffer with existing mental health issues when we know in reality so many in the LGBTQ plus community experience negative reactions to queerness as a catalyst for mental health struggles themselves. Kieran has had this leveled against him but also coming from within before he even has the new guilt and trauma of remembering the rising and the pale wars because we realise in the second season Kieran remembers not just snatches of his time killing and eating the living but the moment of his rebirth too. All there is is just darkness. It's so dark doesn't make a difference if your eyes are open or closed. What you think is that you've been buried alive. In the treatment centre at the start of the show, we see Kieran and the other newly treated PDS sufferers repeating the same rehearsed phrase that we can tell that Kieran doesn't quite believe yet. I am a partially deceased syndrome sufferer and what I did in my untreated state was not my fault. 
where many zombie movies focus on the terror of being hunted and the catharsis of fighting these creatures, In the Flesh makes us consider the traumatic implications of this fight. If the corpses rise from the dead, they are the bodies of your loved ones, your neighbours. Those infected with the virus are people that you know and care about. What kind of traumatic toll does it take to have to kill them after seeing them utterly removed from their humanity? We see within Kieran this deep sense of shame that's familiar to many queer people around who he is. And this is amplified by even his loved ones, as it is for many of us in real life. The experience that even those who claim to love you in private will not show that love openly in public because of who you are and how it would look. The fear from parents of how others react to their children's authentic selves, which feels like loving protection to them, but stifling discomfort to their children. Kieran's family literally hide him when he first returns home, keeping him indoors and away from windows. His father gives him his treatment injections as quickly as possible, not wanting to talk to his son about his fear or anxieties and then bundles him into a literal closet when they get an unexpected visitor not listening to his son's protests and only letting him out once he's had a panic attack after a flashback to waking up in his coffin it feels important to acknowledge here that the real life treatment of marginalized and mentally ill people as well as those with trauma is often inhumane how many people are ready to turn away refugees who have survived war natural disaster and persecution how many children have been forced into conversion therapy which is still legal in the uk how many exposés have there been about careless abuse and insisted living facilities, nursing homes and psychiatric care? How many jokes are made about prisoner abuse and assault? Dr. Megan Jeromele has written about this connection. Our gestures of rehabilitation are designed to make us feel more human and transform the recipients of that unsolicited help into people who, while they may still technically be alive, have been stripped of the agency that would imbue that life with meaning. In this way, the treatment of PDS sufferers is not a fiction. Like most dystopian or post-apocalyptic texts, it's a mirror to the injustices of our present reality. Politics and activism. We see this particularly clearly in the second season, with the inclusion of the one-issue anti-PDS political party Victus reflecting actual right-wing and nationalistic parties often opposing equality like UKIP or the BNP. PDS sufferers lose their British citizenship in the show and are forced to work menial jobs for local government for the chance to earn back that right. This is dubbed the Department for Partially Deceased Affairs Community Giveback Scheme and is delivered in PSA video form with a cheerful friendliness that betrays its sinister reality. At first, most of the PDS sufferers are keen to earn back their rights, deciding to move forward within the system rather than thinking to challenge it. After all, if you acknowledge that you're being treated inhumanely, that you have no power, that's a brutal thing to come to terms with. Not just your own circumstances, but the idea that other people were capable of doing that to you deliberately. And that's assuming that you can change it. After all, this system is remarkably similar to workfare policies implemented at various times in the UK, the concept being that people must undertake work in return for their welfare benefit payments or risk losing them. These essentially become jobs that pay under minimum wage, allow governments to artificially decrease unemployment figures, and have no employee protections, limiting time available to find actual employment. The governmental implementation of policies that don't protect or even simply help marginalised people is not exactly a new concept. The queer foregrounding in the show makes these plot points even more stark, airing while marriage equality still hadn't been passed in the UK. In fact, at the time of the airing, there were a lot of public debates about equality and whether or not it should happen. And in fact, there still are within the current moral panic around trans people in the UK. When marginalised voices demand equality, the fear from those in power creates a backlash that often increases in humanity and decreases compassion as equality begins to approach. Yet this hostility is still couched in the language of protection, safety and order. This kind of veneer of political civility drops in in the flesh when MP Maxine Martin tackles an untreated PDS sufferer and uses a power drill to kill them, and later covers up the killing of another PDS sufferer who was in fact fact being safely treated. The policy and the politicians have no interest in protecting PDS sufferers at all. How far might the same be said for many of the politicians of today in their treatment of any marginalised group in society? In case you couldn't tell, the zombie genre is one of my favourites in cinema. I adore movies like Wreck, 28 Days Later, Train to Busan. Adding queerness to this genre just makes sense to me. After all, queer people exist, you know, they'd be in the zombie apocalypse, same as anyone else. But adding queerness with intention and driving into its potential is even better. Metaphors in horror are never one-to-one -one literal comparisons. You know, that's why it's a 
metaphor. But the use of queerness canonically on screen can elevate these thematic elements even further. It shines a light on our suffering and our joys. It can give us the heroic central characters we're so often denied, or provide the kind of socio-political commentary horror is known for without painting queerness as villainous by default. If you enjoyed this video and would like to support what I do here, then it will leave a link to my Patreon below, along with links to my book, my podcast, and all my social media, so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.